Hi, I'm Melissa. Welcome to Fairy Park Live. I'm so glad you've joined us today. Let's get started. Thank you very much, Melissa. Welcome to Fairway Park Live. It's good to have you with us. This morning we are celebrating who God is and what God is doing. I trust that you are ready to rejoice in God's goodness today. We're going to be celebrating God's love this morning. Our songs are focused around God's love for us and our love for him. I hope that you have had a chance to print out the song sheet so that you can join with us this morning. I will be singing in just a moment from that, but let me remind you that if you have prayer requests or praises to share, please do so in the chat here on Facebook. Uh, if you're watching this later, uh, just email them to us and we'll be glad to share them along. Thank you so much for joining us. It's a rainy day outside, but I hope that there is sunshine in your soul this morning. Let's take our song sheets and we're going to begin by singing, Oh, how I love Jesus. There is a name I love to hear. I love to sing its worth. Let's sing together this morning, all right? There is a name I love to hear. I love to sing its worth. It sounds like music in my ear. The sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. It tells me of a Savior's love who died to set me free. It tells me of his precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea. Oh, how I love Jesus, Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. It tells me what my Father hath in store for every day. And though I tread a darksome path, yield sunshine all the way. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. It tells of one whose loving heart can feel my deepest woe, who in each sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. Oh, how I love Jesus, Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. We'll keep singing this morning another hymn of our faith. My Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. Let's sing together, all right? My Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine. For thee all the folly of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior art thou. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. I love thee because thou hast first loved me and purchased my pardon on Calvary's tree. I love thee for wearing the thorns on thy brow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. I love thee in life, I will love thee in death and praise thee as long as thou lendest me breath, and say when the death do lies cold on my brow, 
If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. In mansions of glory and endless delight, I'll ever adore thee in heaven so bright. I'll sing with the glittering crown on my brow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. I trust that you are uh, able to sing with us and sing about God's love today. Let's take our Bibles this morning. We're going to be reading from Psalm 69 this morning. Psalm 69, and we're going to be reading uh, all the verses that are there in the psalm. There are 36 verses in this psalm, so I trust that you are ready for that. So get your copy of God's Word. Let's open it up together. We're going to read from Psalm 69, the 69th Psalm, as we read the title and then all 36 verses that are there. All right, let's read together. To the chief musician, set to the lilies, a psalm of David. Save me, O God. For the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I have come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. I am weary with my crying. My throat is dry. My eyes fail while I wait for my God. Those who hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. They are mighty who would destroy me. Being my enemies wrongfully, though I've stolen nothing, I still must restore it. O God, you know my foolishness, and my sins are not hidden from you. Let not those who wait for you, O Lord God of hosts, be ashamed because of me. Let not those who seek you be confounded because of me, O God of Israel, because for your sake I have borne reproach. Shame has covered my face. I have become a stranger to my brothers and an alien to my mother's children. Because zeal for your house has eaten me up and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me, when I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that became my reproach. I also made sackcloth my garment. I became a byword to them. Those who sit in the gate speak against me, and I am the song of the drunkards. But as for me, my prayer is to you. O Lord, in the acceptable time, O God, in the multitude of your mercy, hear me in the truth of your salvation. Deliver me out of the mire, and let me not sink. Let me be delivered from those who hate me, and out of the deep waters. Let not the flood water overflow me, nor let the deep swallow me up, and let not the pit shut its mouth on me. Hear me, O Lord, for your loving kindness is good. Turn to me according to the multitude of your tender mercies, and do not hide your face from your servant, for I am in trouble. Hear me speedily. Draw near to my soul and redeem it. Deliver me because of my enemies. You know my reproach, my shame, and my dishonor. My adversaries are all before you. Reproach has broken my heart, and I am full of heaviness. I looked for someone to take pity, but there was none. I, and for comforters, but I found none. They also gave me gall for my food, and for my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Let their table become a snare for them, and their well-being a trap. Let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see, and make their loins shake continually. Pour out your indignation upon them, and let your wrathful anger take hold of them. Let their dwelling place be desolate, 
Let no one live in their tents, for they persecute the ones you have struck and talk of the grief of those you have wounded. Add iniquity to their iniquity and let them not come into your righteousness. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. But I am poor and sorrowful. Let your salvation, O God, set me up on high. I will praise the name of God with a song and will magnify him with thanksgiving. This also shall please the Lord better than an ox or bull, which has horns and hooves. The humble shall see this and be glad. And you who seek God, your hearts shall live. For the Lord hears the poor and does not despite his prisoners. Let heaven and earth praise him, the seas and everything that moves in them. For God will save Zion and build the cities of Judah, that they may dwell there and possess it. Also the descendants of his servants shall inherit it, and those who love his name shall dwell in it. We'll ask God to add his blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. I trust that you are taking time over the week and throughout the days that we are enduring this sheltering in place and that you are seeing and acknowledging and recognizing and recording God's blessings to you. God has been so good. He continues to demonstrate his goodness to us. Let me remind you of the great need that we have to pray for one another. Let me remind you of the great blessing that it is to pray for one another. As we gather together here online, we have the opportunity to fellowship with one another. We have the opportunity to encourage one another. And it doesn't just take place during these live streams. It takes place over text messages and phone calls, cards and letters, I trust that you saw in the uh, loop preceding the, the service this morning, you saw some of the letters that have come in that we've scanned and kind of passed those along to the church family. Uh, I've been given the suggestion maybe we need to have a, a bin here that we can pull out some lucky winners and, and read, their, read their notes uh, here on, online or read them live during the service. We might do that, but encourage one another. Let me remind you to be praying for one another. Do continue to be praying for Judy's mom, Twyla. Be continuing to pray for her health and strength as she's regaining that strength and is out of the area here. Uh, Judy's not able to go up and take care of her, so be praying for Twyla. Continue to pray for Marlene's brother, Richard. As you know, he'd been in hospital. There had been some different things going on with reactions to his chemotherapy treatment and, and illness. Uh, they were able on Friday to do a procedure that alleviated a large amount of the discomfort and pain that he was in. And we are so thankful that God is ministering not only to his soul, but to his body as well. Do keep Richard in your prayers. Twana mentioned on Wednesday night that we need to be praying for her granddaughter, Lindsay, who is... Uh, who has recently found out that her cancer has returned and is waiting to, to find out what the next course of action will be, what the treatments will be, and, and how they will proceed. Do keep Lindsay in your prayers. Keep Twana in your prayers as well. Uh, I know that uh, her granddaughter Erin is going to be moving out this way, uh, moving from coast to coast, coming back here to uh, the area, and I know Twana is excited about that. So be praying for Erin as she travels as well. Uh, do remember to be praying for our missionaries in Uganda. The census area is experiencing severe flooding. And as that comes through, there is not just the water that is there. It's also the crops that are being affected. It's also pe people's lives and livelihood that is being affected. So do be praying for the census there in Uganda. I'd also ask you to be praying for our our missionary friends Bob and Becky Bass. You saw their picture uh, on the loop before the service this morning. Uh, they are uh, going through some uh, transition where they are organizing some new things that they are doing. And th that paperwork is planned to be submitted uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, if the government offices are open, which they say they will be, uh, they will be filing that paperwork to get some more things organized and, and moving along. Be praying that not only would the offices be open, but that Bob and Becky would be able to make that appointment so that they can get the paperwork filed so that things can continue to come together. Do be praying for the basses there this morning. 
Camera two, and the basses are watching. Okay, so I, I was told I don't look here. I look over here now, and uh, we've got some new technology. So we're, we're, we've got floor direction and everything. Uh, so if I've misrepresented anything, Bob or Becky, you, you can feel free to add to the chat stream and let them know how to be, uh, be praying. But we are praying for uh, your ministry there in Brazil, not Brazil, Peru, uh, praying for your ministry in Peru, and know that the Lord is, is continuing to guide and direct there. Are there other prayer requests that have come in? Uh, I know I was just told to look over this camera, but I'm going to look back over here because it's closer to the person I need to talk to. So, our, yeah, cut back to this camera. Okay, a relative of a friend's relative. A friend's relative. One of Melissa's friend's relatives is. One of, oh, aunt, okay. One of aunt, my sister's. One of Andrea's friend's relatives. The joy of being live, folks. Whose name is Melissa. Okay. Is having emergency surgery after getting her arm caught in some farm machine. Okay, so a friend of my sister, uh, a friend and a relative, they're connected through some family have, having a farm accident and uh, is having to have some emergency surgery. So be praying for that person. I'm assuming they're back in Pennsylvania uh, or in that area. So be praying for uh, our family's friend, uh, Melissa. It's not Melissa from our church who's having arm surgery, but be praying for, uh, for that need as well. All right. I'm not going to try to get tongue-tied again there, and, and I'm not going to try to, uh, to do that. So let's, let's go to prayer this morning. Let's be praying for one another. Let me share another praise with you. Thank you so very much, those of you who are continuing on a regular basis to be giving to the ministry here at Fairway Park Baptist Church. I know that we are not meeting uh, as, a, as a group uh, in the building, but the, the bills still do come due. And I, I don't mention it often enough about the needs that we have, the ongoing financial needs that we have. But you are very faithful to be giving and very faithful to support what God is doing. I thank you for that. Uh, the month of April, we did not have any meetings in the building. And yet God met all of our financial needs. Uh, I, I was thrilled and just overwhelmed at how good God has been through you and your faithful giving to see what God is allowing to take place here. As you know, our fiscal year was scheduled to end at the end of April. Uh, we've continued the budget on and that uh, until we can gather together and, and approve a new budget. But our obligations for the last fiscal year have been met. God has met them. We ended the year in the black. We ended the year uh, with a, a small surplus of funds, but a surplus of funds. God has been so good, and we thank and praise him for that. We're looking forward to seeing how God will continue to bless. But let's go to prayer this morning, thanking the Lord for what he's done, even as we ask the Lord to continue to bless in the needs that we continue to have. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the many blessings that we have seen over this past week. I thank you for those who were here at the church yesterday working to upgrade the equipment so that we can see and hear one another better and with fewer uh, interruptions. I thank you for the, the skill that you've given to Larry and Jeremy and Steve and Kelvin to put the, the technology together and allow it to function well. I thank you that Charles is able to keep things running each week and I thank you for the work of these men who are working very much behind the scenes and yet doing a very necessary work so that the ministry can continue. We thank you for that. We thank you that Richard's procedure uh, was able to be uh, completed on Friday and that the relief that was hoped for was found. I ask that you would continue to bless in Richard's life, that you would continue to demonstrate your healing hand in his situation. We pray for Twana's granddaughter, who's waiting to hear what the next course of action will be, and we ask that you would give comfort and peace as she waits. We pray for Erin as she's going to be moving, that you would give safety as those plans are undertaken. We pray for this uh, friend, uh, Melissa, who is uh, undergoing surgery due to a, a f accident with some farm equipment. We ask that you would not only guide the doctor's hands and give healing and reparation and restoration where it's needed, 
but that you would comfort the one who is hurting and their family. We thank you that even during times of trouble, we can look to you. We pray for the paperwork that's being filed in Peru uh, tomorrow, that you would give uh, favor with those government officials that will be reviewing it, that the uh, process would go forward and that we would continue to see your hand guiding and leading and directing in the lives of Bob and Becky and, and Colton and the ministry that they have. We do pray for the Carmichaels and their ministry in Brazil, that you would continue to guide and direct them and that you would continue to provide for their needs. We pray for the Stensuses in Uganda. You know the impact that these floods are having on uh, the town, on the people, and on their future. We ask that even during this time that you would continue to minister to them and through them and that your word would continue to go forward and provide a beacon of help and hope to those who are hurting. We thank you for the opportunity we have to gather together this morning. We look forward to the time when we will gather in the same room. But Father, we thank you that we are gathered around your throne. And as we look into your word this morning, we ask that, that your Holy Spirit would teach us, that we would learn from your word, that you would challenge us and change us so that we would look more like your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Let's take our Bibles again this morning. We're going to go back to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12. Mark chapter 12 this morning, we're going to look at another brief segment that is here in this chapter. There have been many discussions that have been taking place in the temple area during this one singular day. Jesus is still moving through the temple, having cleansed it the day before. And when we say cleansed it, he cleared out those who were doing business there. And there's still this circle of discussion that is swirling around him. He's been having several short yet very pointed conversations that focus on his authority. He was asked who gave him the authority or permission to act the way that he did. And in response, he told the story of the farmer who leased out his field to uh, tenant farmers who then refused to recognize his authority and killed his representatives until the farmer the owner finally sent his son, and they killed the son. He was then asked about the authority of the government. Should taxes be paid? And we're familiar with that. Jesus' response was that if the imprint of Caesar's image was on the coins, then return it to, to Caesar. But where we find the imprint of God's image, and that's in each one of us, that needs to be given to God because he is the one who owns and possesses us. Jesus was questioned about the authority of Moses, especially as it dealt with the afterlife, and we looked at that a little bit last time. Jesus' response was that God's power and God's promises were very clearly seen in guaranteeing that there is a life after this one. And now we come to a segment where there is one final question being asked. We read at the end of this paragraph in verse 34, after this, they dared not ask any more questions. Let's direct our attention to Mark chapter 12, verses 28 to 34. Then one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that Jesus had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like it, is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So the scribe said to him, Well said, teacher, you have spoken the truth, for there is one God, and there is no other but he. 
and to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul, with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now, when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. But after that, no one dared question him. Once again, Jesus shows remarkable insight into God's word. This final question arises. This final question is, is brought and presented. Which of God's commandments is most important? The answer that Jesus gives is not new information. But it is revolutionary in its impact. This scribe, this professional legal scholar, was asking the question that had 613 potential answers. You see, as they looked through the law of Moses, they found 613 commandments. 365 of them were thou shalt not. If you're doing math on the fly, that means there are 248 commandments that say thou shalt. So out of those 248 positive answers, those 365 negative commands, out of those 613 commands, which one is most important? There were discussions often to try to summarize. How can we encapsulate the entire law? Can we boil it down to just one or two precepts? How can we do that? History records a famous discussion that uh, a person said they would convert to Judaism if the, the rabbi could recite all of the important commandments while standing on one foot. Jesus' answer could be given in one word. Love. You see, Jesus says it all boils down to love. Now, I want you to listen this morning as Jesus explains how that when it comes to pleasing God, all you need is love. We find, first of all, that this love needs to be a love for God. There needs to be a love for God. And as Jesus starts to summarize the entirety of all the laws that Moses had given, all of the things that God's people were commanded to do, he says it comes down to this. You need to have love for God. And the reason you need to have love for God is because God has a unique basis Jesus quotes a passage that is very familiar to those who are listening to him. It's a passage that we call the Shema. Now, the reason it's called the Shema is because in Hebrew, the first word of this passage that he quotes is Shema. Shema Israel. Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. It's recorded for us in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. And I said, it's a familiar passage because every Jewish person repeated that prayer, that phrase, that verse. Remember Israel, hear Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength. He repeated that twice every day. It was a reminder of his duty to God. Because as a member of God's people, they need to remember who he was. The Lord is one. It's not just talking about his, his oneness being uh, three in one, Father, Son, and Spirit in one. It's, it's talking about God's oneness being there is no other like him. He's the only one there is. There's none other like him. We read in Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 and 7, as Moses has asked God to show me who you are, show me your glory. God says, I can't let you see my full glory. I will hide you and I will pass before you and, and as I pass by, I will let you see the very tail end of the parade as it were. 
And even that was life-changing to Moses. It caused his face to shine so much for seeing God's radiant glory in just the, the glimpses as it faded away that it, it transformed his face and the people were afraid because his face shone like the sun having seen God's glory. And as God proceeds past Moses, he makes this declaration, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generations this god is unique there is no other like him we need to have a love for god because he's unique there is no one else like god there is no thing else like god he's the only one And because he's the only one, our love needs to have an undivided focus. Notice what Jesus says about the way that we love God. Our love is to be undivided. It's our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength, all functioning together to show love for God. Our emotion, our inner being, our intellect, our energy, everything. There is no part of our life that is left unaffected by God's love and our love for God. The whole entirety of our being needs to be focused on God. Not that we love him most of the time and love something else for part of the time. But that our heart, our mind, our soul, our strength, every last facet of our being is focused on loving God. Focused on loving Him. This love that's being described is a type of love that gives and gives and gives and gives. Willing to sacrifice anything to gain. To gain what is best for the one loved. It's used to describe the love that God has as he gives his son. A love that is willing to give what is best for those who are loved. Oh, it's, it's also used to describe those who will do whatever it takes to get ahead in life. But again, they're willing to do whatever it takes for the object loved. The problem is the object they love is themselves. It's your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. Does God have all of that? Does he have an undivided focus in your life? Or are you distracted by something else? You see, this undivided focus is is not just an undivided love, but it's an undiluted love. Notice what Jesus says? All your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. Undiluted. All of the facets of life are to be focused on loving God. Not just some ceremonial obligation where, yes, I'll go because that's what I'm supposed to do. This is a moral duty that we owe to God. That everything, not just everything we have, but everything we are, is devoted to showing love for God. It's the kind of love that God has for us. And as we show that love, we are just merely reflecting his character back to him. Look what God does for us in John chapter 3. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Is that the type of love that you reflect 
What about the type of love that's described for us in Romans chapter 8, verse 32? God, who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. What is it that you're holding back? Oh, you say you love God, but there's a part that you're not willing to give up. Do you love God? See, Jesus says the greatest commandment, the biggest one, the most important one, it's love. And that love is a love for God. But secondly, would you notice, it's not just that we need a love for God. Secondly, we need to have a love for God's creation. We need to have a love for God's creation. We drop down to verses 31 and 32 and verse 33. Jesus says the second commandment is very much like the first one. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. That love is not only focused on God, but it's focused on God's creation. You say, how can I love God with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind, all my strength, and love something else? Hey, you're just throwing up needless, needless problems that don't exist. I have two boys. I love each of them completely. It's not that I love one and hate the other. There are times when I'm talking to them that I say, you know what, I love you the most and you're my favorite. And then very quickly I add that, I add this phrase, and I tell your brother the same thing. Because it's true. I do love them the most. I love them completely. I love them fully. They are my favorite. One is my favorite oldest son. The other is my favorite youngest son. We can love God and others because a love for God will demonstrate itself in a love for others. That love then gets focused on others because neighbors are now involved. Jesus quotes again from the law of Moses. Reminding this lawyer, this legal scholar, this one who had studied Moses' law, that there was an obligation towards others. He quotes from Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. Leviticus 19, 18 says this, You shall not take vengeance or bear any grudge against the children of your people. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, based on that law, the Jewish people were commanded not to mistreat one another because they were all God's people. So those who were also of their, their nationality were to be treated kindly. They were neighbors. The problem is there were people around them who were not neighbors. And those of you who like to think the way I think, hey, if I'm supposed to love these people, that means I don't have to love those people over there. But you remember the words that Jesus spoke in Luke chapter 10? Because there was a person who says, well, who is my neighbor? And Jesus gave him the story of the Good Samaritan. Now, the whole point of the story of the Good Samaritan was this. Being a neighbor means showing kindness and mercy to someone who has need. It's not based on nationality. It's not based on their belief system. It's not based on anything other than the fact that you have the means to help. They have a need that needs help. So we focus on others. The point that Jesus is making is quite clear. You cannot love God without loving others. Because those are people that God loves. And if you love God, you're going to love what he loves. And guess what God loves? God loves people. The Apostle John would go on to write a book that we call 1 John. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 21, John writes this, Here's the commandment that we have. He who loves God must love his brother also. We can't love God without showing love for others. Well, okay, I'll, I'll be kind to them. No, no, no. Love. It's the same word. Willing to give anything in order to bring about a favorable result for the person you're showing love to. 
The same love that God uses to give his son is the same love that we are required to show to others. Not just when it suits us, not just when we have the time and resources and inclination. We're commanded to do that. That means that our self needs to take a lower place. You will love your neighbor the way you love yourself. Let's face it, we love ourselves. We try to put a roof over our heads so that we stay dry and warm. We seek to put food on our table so that our stomachs are filled and we're comfortable. We'll put on clothes, take off clothes to maintain a nice comfort level. We'll do what it takes to provide for the things that we need, the things that we want, and even the things that we desire. But to help someone else? Huh, man, they're on their own. Whoa, whoa, whoa. That's not loving others like loving self. That's not making sure that they have their needs provided, that they're kept comfortable, that they have their desires met. Doesn't mean you have to meet all of them, but are we giving so that others are assisted? See, the scribe who's hearing this and Jesus who's saying it, they both agree. This type of love is better. It's better to have this type of love than to go through all of the sacrifices saying, well, I've done something that has offended or hurt my neighbor. It would be much better to show love to them than to try to make up for the things you actually have done to them later. The prophet Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 15 asks King Saul, does the Lord have as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying his voice? It's better to obey than to make sacrifice. Well, sure, yeah, it is better to obey. We understand that. Well, wait a minute. God's command is to love your neighbor. It's better to obey that than to make up for it later. What about the prophet Hosea? Hosea chapter 6, verse 6, God says, I desire mercy not sacrifice. I'd rather you show kindness to someone who needs it rather than apologize and make up for the way that you mistreated them. Romans chapter 13, Paul writes to the Romans, here's the commandments, don't commit adultery, don't murder, don't steal, don't bear false witness, don't covet. If there's other commandments, they can all be summed up in this, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Love is the fulfillment, the living out of the law. See, Jesus says that this commandment is so important. All we need is love. A love for God. And a love for God's creation. How often do we do that? How often do we put others' needs first? Or are we so consumed with our own selfish desires that everyone else, if they have time or if there's anything left over, they can deal with it then? We'll deal with you after, after my needs are taken care of. We have a phrase in the family where I grew up, after me, you come next. Hey, I'm, I'm happy for you to be in line, but you, you come after me. Is that the way we treat one another? All too often it is. But God's command is we need to have love for God, love for God's creation. Finally, we need to have a love for God's kingdom. At the end of all this discussion, the, the teacher, the scribe, the lawyer, the legal expert says, you've said the right thing. There's nothing better than having a love for God that demonstrates itself in a love for others. And Jesus understands that this man has been very wise in what he said. He's not bought into all the discussions about how do we keep the law, how do we do this, how do we do it. He's understood exactly what God has said. And yet, listen to Jesus' words. Recorded for us in verse 34, Jesus said to him, you're not far from the kingdom of God. Now, I'm going to make a point that seems a little obvious, but I want to be sure you understand it. When Jesus says that that scribe is not far from the kingdom, 
it means that he's not there yet. He's close, but he's not there. He had the right information in his head. But maybe he wasn't acting on it. That knowledge had not transferred itself into a belief, become part of his character, that then affected the way that he treated others. Now let's give this man the benefit of the doubt. He could be keeping the law as best as he could, not willfully or willingly or knowingly mistreating others, and yet still he could be far from the kingdom because it was all done with the knowledge that I have to do this to be made right with God, and that is not it at all. The law does not tell us how to be made right with God. The law tells us that we are not right with God. That it's impossible for us to be right with God. The law shows us how short we have fallen, how drastically we have missed the mark of God's perfection. It's not meant to encourage us to say, look how good you've done. It's meant to show, here's where you failed. Here's the places where you haven't kept the law. Here's the places where your love for God has not been what it should be. Here's the areas where your love for others has fallen far short of God's perfect standard. This man knew all the right information. He was close. He was not far from the kingdom, but he was not there yet. There's a huge difference between knowing the right information and then trusting it and acting on it. Being close to the kingdom does not count. We say that close only counts in horseshoes and maybe hand grenades. Close does not count to being in the kingdom. You can be close to the kingdom, but you'll be far from it. You're not there. So what is Jesus saying? Jesus is very simply saying that that love that we have for God needs to prompt our obedience. You can know all the right things about God. You can know all the information that's contained in the Bible. You can run the category on Jeopardy whenever there's a Bible-based topic. It will do you no good until you act on that information. Until you allow that information to affect what you believe and how you act and how you respond. And what the Bible will teach you is that we can do nothing but God has done everything that he has provided the way for us to be right with him. Not by doing anything, but by trusting that he has done it all already. His son, Jesus, who proved himself to be the Messiah, has done everything necessary for you to have a relationship with God. You see, you can love God mentally. You can love others mentally. You'll be close, not far from the kingdom, but you won't be there. And friend, I say this lovingly, I would rather you be there than be close. It takes transferring that trust in yourself, that trust in something that you've come up with, and placing it all on the already finished work of Jesus Christ. The one who has done everything necessary so that you can have life and godliness, a right standing with God. The scribe had all the information he needed, but what he needed was a new heart. The prophet Ezekiel in chapter 36 of of his book Verse 26, there's a promise that God makes. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. The old heart is described as a heart of stone, one that's hard and hardened towards the things of God. God says, I will change your heart. I'll change the way you think and act and feel so that you'll care about the things I care about. So that now you can love God with all your heart, all your soul, 
all your mind, all your strength. See, this love that we say that we have for God needs to lead to some very inevitable conclusions. You say you love God. Do you love others? If you're not loving others, you don't have a love for God. You say that you love God. Are you trusting his son? If you're not trusting his son, you really have just a head knowledge or a mouth speaking that, oh, I love God. But it's not really going to change the things that I do or the way that I act or the way that I live. If you love God, show that by loving others. Show that by trusting his son. What do you love? You see, Jesus says all you need is love. So what do you love? Do you love God? The one who loved you first? You can know a lot about him. You can know a lot about his love, but until you allow that love to motivate and guide your actions, you're not going to be pleasing to him. Jesus was right. To please God, all you need is love. A wholehearted love that is lived out by trusting Jesus and caring for others. Is that the love that you have? As we respond to what God is saying this morning, I'd like to pray for you. So let's pray together. Father, thank you for your goodness and thank you for sharing with us what is most important. There are a lot of commands and many of them show us the the ways that we have, have erred, have showed us the ways that we have failed. But as we look at them in totality, it reminds us that our love is to be focused on you because there's no one like you. Our love is then shown and demonstrated towards others because they are made in your image. And that love is directed towards your kingdom, that place where your rule and reign are clearly seen and evidenced. And so I pray for those who are listening today that you would allow their love to be more than just something that is said or something that's acknowledged, but it would be something that is experienced and felt so that you would be seen as great and glorious because you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Listen, if you'd like to discuss more about God's love and how you can have that loving relationship with God, please, there will be a card at the end of the service that gives my email address, email me. Let's talk. Let's let's discuss this. This is too important to put off until the shelter in place is lifted. It's something that needs to be done now. But as we continue in our service and as we wrap up this morning, we're going to sing one more song, a familiar chorus, Oh, how he loves you and me. Let's remind ourselves of how great God's love is, even as we're called to respond and share that love with others. All right, let's sing together. Oh, how he loves you and me. Oh, how he loves you and me. He gave his life. What more could he give? Oh, how he loves you, oh, how he loves me, oh, how he loves you and me. Jesus to Calvary did go, his love for sinners to show, what he did there brought hope from despair. Oh, how he loves you. Oh, how he loves me. Oh, how he loves you and me. Let me remind you as we finish about some announcements for the week ahead. Those that are serving on the deacon board, we're going to have a meeting this afternoon at 3 o'clock. Trust that you'll meet us there for that. Tonight at 5, there will be a sing-along here on Facebook uh, with the First Baptist Church of Los Gatos. If you're here on 
uh, the Facebook page, you could go to FB Los Gatos. You'll find the information there about their event. Uh, it will start at 5 o'clock, going to be a sing-along, lasts about half an hour or so, filled with good music, filled with encouragement. And I trust that you will take time out of your day to make that a part of your schedule. Let me remind you that on uh, Wednesday, we will meet here at 6.30 uh, for another live stream. Uh, Mrs. Cheryl Harris will continue the lessons on Joseph. I'll be sharing from God's Word on our Wednesday night service. Ladies will meet on Thursday at 6.30 via Zoom. Uh, they'll be meeting uh, to do their Bible study, and they're going to continue uh, looking about having a worry-free living, I believe, is the study that they're doing right now. And so if you need information on joining that Bible study, please contact Melissa. She'll get you the information for that. Men, we will have a prayer time Saturday morning at 8 o'clock. And I trust that you'll meet us there. Again, it's via Zoom. If you need the information, let me know. I'll be glad to get it to you so that we can meet together for a time of prayer and fellowship. Next Sunday, we'll be back here at 10 o'clock for our morning worship time. I trust that you'll join us and uh, look forward to that as well. Between now and the next time we see one another or communicate with one another, it's my prayer that God would richly bless you, that he would keep you safe, that he would keep you focused on him. I know that these are continued trying times. The longer we go through this, the more impatient we get. God is faithful. God has not abandoned us. God has not left us alone in the midst of this. James says that the trying of our faith works patience. The problem with developing patience is that it takes time. So allow this time that we're spending to develop a godly character in you in the way that we react, the way that we act, and the way that we respond. May God richly bless you until the next time we speak with one another. Be well. Be safe. May God bless you.